Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly virtual roundtable in which we uh, discuss all things Beatles, uh, their history, what's going on now, and what may be happening in the future, and I think we'll, we're going to be discussing some of that as we uh, as we move along. Uh, I'm Al Sussman from Beatle Fan Magazine, and I'm here with my three co-hosts. First of all, the uh, the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hi, Ken. Hey, Al. Hi, everybody. And out on the West Coast, the Beatles examiner and uh, author of a number of examiner columns on examiner.com, and that's Steve Marinucci. Steve, hey. Hey, Al. Hello, everyone. And last but certainly not least, our resident musicologist, uh, a longtime contributor to Beatle Fan Magazine, uh, also a longtime classical music reviewer for the New York Times, and uh, currently working for a number of different publications and, and such, uh, doing all manner of uh, all manner of music, you might say, and that's Alan Cozen. Hey, Alan. Hey, Al. How are you doing? And hello, everyone. Just fine. Now, we've got uh, one piece of business that I think we're going to take care of first that we've actually been meaning to get to for several weeks. But because there's been so much news, plus two uh, two shows ago, we had uh, a great conversation with Fred Velez about the Monkees and especially the current Monkees album, that we never really got to this. And the kind of the Unfortunately, the inspiration for it was the recent passing of Tony Barrow, who was the the Beatles press officer from 1962 to 1968, uh, the fellow who came up with the uh, the term Fab Four and was responsible for all of those uh, interesting Beatle fact sheets. Uh, that came out in the teen magazines in 1964 and also did the liner notes for three of the first four Beatles LPs in England. And I got to thinking after Tony's passing that the inner circle of the the people that were most responsible for the day-to-day workings of, of the Beatles is that inner circle is rapidly shrinking uh, almost to the point where it's almost disappeared. And I, I, I made a list of people who, who were part of, as I said, the, the inner circle, the, the people that were responsible for the day-to-day activities of the group. So, so for instance, there's no wives, there's no girlfriends, uh, even the engineers, people like Jeff Emmerich and Ken Scott and Norman Smith and Chris Thomas uh, are really not on my list, though George Martin is. George, you know, without George Martin and Brian Epstein, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the story doesn't happen. You know, the Beatles play out their days in Liverpool as a band and then probably, you know, the never get farther than than there and eventually break up and we never uh, we never hear of them. But because of their crucial entrance into the story at the at the appropriate times George Martin and Brian and Brian Epstein have to be the two most important parts of that inner circle uh, but also from that inner circle you've got Neil Aspinall who was the, the 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 group's personal assistant and was later on the CEO of Apple Corps You've got Mal Evans, who was their their road manager and uh, later on personal assistant, and uh, was, you know, one of their their most dependable aides, you know, not only on the road but uh, you know through throughout their whole career, including in the studio. Peter Brown, who mm-hmm. was uh, another personal assistant and was uh, one of the board members of Apple at the at the beginning. Derek Taylor, who was the the other press officer 
for for the group along with Tony Barrow in 1963 and 64, then had a falling out with Brian Epstein, left left the group, went out to Hollywood where he did publicity for a number of, of bands, including the Birds and Paul Revere of the Raiders and the Beach Boys, etc. And then in 1968, came back to Apple as the basically Tony Barrow's successor as the press officer there. So Derek Taylor, Tony Barrow, as I mentioned, Alistair Taylor, who was Brian mm-hmm. Epstein's personal assistant and later became the the GM of Apple Corps and uh, was the man in that uh, that Apple that Apple ad um, that that ran in 1968. The you know sort of musical jack of all trades who could play everything with the with the headline this man has talent that was <laughs> uh, that was Alistair Taylor uh, then there was Tony Bramwell the uh, who was the head of Apple Films and later became the CEO of Apple Records they threw these titles around very very liberally Mm-hmm. But uh, but he uh, Tony was uh, was responsible as a producer for uh, for several of of the Beatles videos. Mm-hmm. So the, that is at least the list that I came up with of the the inner circle. And from that list, the only people, the only two, there are only two members of that list who are still with us in this life. And that's uh, Tony Bramwell, who is, uh, uh, for those of us who uh, are on Facebook, is a very familiar presence. And um, and Peter Brown, who has been something of a non-person in the Beatle world, at least, uh, for about the last uh, 33 years because of that book that he and, and Stephen Gaines wrote in the early, uh, the early 80s called The Love You Make. So my question is, first of all, am I missing anybody? And and also, who would you consider of that that list? Again, we'll 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 exempt Brian Epstein and George Martin because they are certainly the most important parts of of the Beatles inner circle. Because they're probably, aside from the the four members of the group themselves, they're probably the most two, the two most important figures in the entire history of the group. But who would you consider the most important links in that in that inner circle? Hmm. Anybody well, want to? Uh, Ken, I that? think you were. I was going to say, I think you covered the major ones there. Uh, I think Mm -hmm. um, I had a couple of other people who, uh, because they were a part of Apple and also a part Mm -hmm. of, uh, they worked with the Beatles before then, were Peter Asher, who was only with Apple really for uh, a brief time. Yeah. And also Pete Shotton, only because of his friendship with John, who later went on to run uh, the Apple Boutique. But again, Mm -hmm. that was for a short period of time. But you're talking about Mm -hmm. the heavyweights, the ones that you mentioned. So, yeah, I, I, I have a tough time deciding who's the most important, but considering the fact that Neil Aspinall was there from the very beginning up until his passing and ran Apple as the CEO and made a lot of decisions with the permission of the four parties, I'd probably mm-hmm. say only because of, of his tenure there, his long association with them, um, I probably would say Neil, but they're all mm-hmm. very important to the Beatles story. Sure. And as far as in, in Neil's case, um, you know, a lot of fans were certainly unhappy for many years with a lot of the decisions he made, uh, especially in terms of releasing rarities and releasing albums, things re- releasing things like Shea Stadium. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. So, uh, but uh, you know, he. As as Ken mentioned, was doing it basically with the say so of the the four directors. Hmm. Right. What about Frida? You know, I mean, I was uh, thinking, yeah, I was thinking, yeah. Here, here, you know, because she she worked for Brian directly, and, mm-hmm. and the fan club is really a major part of their early, uh, you know, sort of fan success in a way, and and she you know stayed through it and uh got got to know them pretty well and and all of that i i think she was you know an insider in, in a way too that uh you know should she she should probably be on the list 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I thought of Frida, and uh, the the only reason I didn't put her on the list was because, for one thing, she was based in Liverpool mm. for basically all of that time. But also, a few months back, uh, Tony Bramwell uh, put out a post on, on Facebook about a film that supposedly was uh, in its uh, early stages about the uh, the fan club secretaries. And, um, you know, I happened to make a comment and ask, asked him if he had be, if, if Frida was going to be involved. And he kind of huffily said Frida wasn't the only fan club secretary. Mm-hmm. I remember that. Mm. I remember that. Um, yeah. I remember that. Um, I, well, I, 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 well I do, she wasn't. I agree with, <laughs> she, no, wasn't she wasn't, but still, I think she had sort of seniority among them, mm-hmm. and, you know, so – well, I, I think more than more than the seniority. I mean, she, like you said, she got close to them. She remained. I think the loyalty factor. She remained very loyal. She didn't sell her store. She was. I mean, they had a practically. They had to persuade her to do, you know, to do the movie. She wasn't. You know, that wasn't something she. That wasn't her idea. That was their idea, and and she didn't want to do it. And. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so I think, yeah, no, I agree with, I definitely agree that Frida should be there for that reason, for basically that reason. Under normal circumstances, no. But because of how close she got, because of the way she stayed loyal to them till, you know, I think that's definitely, definitely a reason to mention her. Mm -hmm. Not only that, she was asked to remain working for the Beatles and to move to London. That's which, true. Which she turned down. So mm-hmm. <laughs> how many people would actually say no to that? No. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Yeah, Very yeah. true. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think we can add we can add Frida to the uh, uh, to the inner circle. And then there's one other person who was Oh, um, don't say Alex. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no, not no no, not Magic Alex. Hmm. But not long after the emergence of Magic Alex, there was another person who, uh, who, shall we say, immersed himself into the inner circle, and that would be mm-hmm. one Alan, Cl- one Alan Klein. Uh, yes. And we've done we we've, uh, uh, we've actually the reason why I bring it bring this up is because Steve has mentioned on more than one occasion that he's gotten. People asking about us talking about Alan Klein. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Alan Klein, not Klein, but Cozen. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get terribly confused. We've got um, Al, Alan and Al, Alan. And Alan so right, we, we exactly. Have to... Had um, semi-volunteered to give us at least, a, at least a little bit of information about uh. um, about about. Good old, good old Alan. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not really an expert on Alan Klein, but, um, you know, he was one of these guys who was uh, definitely of his age uh, in the record world, which is, you know, a, a, a guy who represented artists, but also represented himself. And he got, um, you know, before the Beatles, a lot of his artists, Sam Cooke and and the Stones, um, what they considered at the time to be very good deals. But then Mm -hmm. because he, generally speaking, wrote in uh, a, a certain amount of participation for himself in the good deals that he got them, which, you know, was not unusual in the late 50s early 60s in music management um, um, a lot of them sort of the stones for instance kind of soured on it I mean and and and, and when the stones soured on it was like right at the time I mean the John Lennon um, took originally Mick Jagger's advice to look into Alan Klein because he had gotten them a really good deal with Decca and by the time Alan Klein was on the scene fighting for his piece of the Beatles. Mick Jagger apparently was thinking better about it and and was warning the Beatles against them. So that was sort of a a weird timing. But, um, uh, you know, and he was a weird opportunist in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, he uh, once he 
got the Beatles and, uh, you know, he got the Beatles and then they broke up instantly, partly over the fact that he got them. And so he represented uh, the rest of them uh, apart from Paul individually. I'm not sure what his involvement with Ringo was, but with George, he was involved uh, for quite a while and that didn't turn out happily. Um, Right. The uh, there was a, a suit over where the money for the concert for Bangladesh went and, mm-hmm. uh, and when who owed what in taxes. And and then there was the whole Bright Tunes lawsuit, which was very odd. It was the one where George was sued because My Sweet Lord sort of is vaguely a little bit like he's so fine. Mm-hmm. Um, which was published by Bright Tunes, which sued George and mm-hmm. um in the process, I mean, to make a long, complicated story short, in the process, George severed his connection with Alan Klein, who then went and bought Bright Tunes. And so that meant that Alan Klein was basically suing his own ex-client, and, and that was regarded by the judge as uh, a little bit improper because, I mean, you already know all of the strategies and, and everything of your of your client. You're now switching mm-hmm. sides. Um, there's kind of a, a an inherent conflict in there. And so they allowed Alan Klein to collect only the amount of money that he paid for Bright Tunes. And then in the end, George Harrison ended up buying Bright Tunes, so he owned both songs. Right. Um, <laughs> And yeah, but yeah, Alan, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure what I can add that that most people don't well, know. Um, well, let's let's put it this way: in the the realm of you know rock managers, you've got Colonel Tom Parker who right. <laughs> who mismanaged Elvis Presley's career to the point of ridiculousness, yeah. um, so much so that his estate basically had to recoup basically almost all of the money that he was <laughs> that, that that he should have made in his lifetime mm. af- after his death then you've got people out and out gangsters like Morris Levy you know right. to- Tommy mm. James in writing his book had to wait until Morris Levy and all of his associates were dead before he could actually publish his book mm-hmm. which <laughs> for is, fear of, it's an amazing mm-hmm. book too yeah it is but for fear of you know any reprisals he had to wait until they were all gone and then of course you've got speaking of opportunists you've got stan polly the man who was responsible for the uh the awful story of Badfinger. Mm-hmm. Oh. You know that I mean the you know unfortunately the suicides of uh, of, of Pete Ham and and Tommy Evans can basically be laid right at the feet of Stan Polly, mm. uh, who completely mismanaged the group and well not only mismanaged them but also uh, uh, profited a great deal. So with all of that, where does Alan Klein a What's his well, his place in that in that pantheon? Well, I mean, he he may not have been as bad as those guys and and a lot of other guys. I mean, there were a lot of you know small operators who were mm-hmm. you know out and out crooks, and you know they were small operators. They didn't get into the headlines. Nobody knew, and you know they just sure. took advantage of their of their clients, and that was mm-hmm. what the business was, you know. Sure. But um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, I find Alan Alan Klein was a, a peculiar guy as well i mean um mm. when when mark lewison and kevin howlett did a a 10-part series for the bbc on john lennon um they came to new york and interviewed alan klein and alan klein said okay you know i'm fine doing the interview but i want to edit the interview so you have to leave the tape with me and against their better judgment they did and they never got the tape so he wasn't in the show, and they said it was a good interview too. But you know, I, I mean, I was just thinking generally. I mean, the the people you've mentioned as being in the inner circle. I mean, this is a mm-hmm. really colorful bunch of characters. I mean, I'm yeah. not sure that that we know that much about the inner circles of a lot of other bands. You know, we may know their manager and a couple, mm-hmm. but but like th- 
this is like, you know, Derek Taylor, I got to know him a bit. I mean, he was a very funny, very erudite guy. I mean, he was a great writer. His, he wrote two books. Uh, mm mm-hmm. Four, no, more than two, three I can think of, maybe more, uh, 50 Years Adrift, um, 20 Years Ago Today. And and, and uh, As Time Goes By. As Time Goes By. Yeah. Yeah. And those are – they're 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 great books. They're mm-hmm. full of Derek's personality. You can hear him talking when you read those pages. And uh, – yeah. And, you know, Neil and Mal, uh, you know, Neil, I think I would agree with Ken was probably the most important of, of the people around them. But I want to say I, I do want to say something on behalf of Peter Brown. OK, sure. Uh, Peter Brown, you know, at the to- at the beginning of Apple. Peter and Neil were sort of both running it, and Peter may have actually had more administ- administrative um, responsibility because he mm-hmm. had done that kind of thing before. And he, in a yeah. way, gets written out of the story. And partly maybe because of the book, but, um, you know, I've I've talked to Peter Brown, and, and also I know Mark Lewison has as well, has spent some time with him because, you know, Mark is interviewing everybody who knows anything you know sure. firsthand and it turns out that you know that book um i think a lot of what you hate about that book is probably more to do with stephen Gaines. exactly um, mm-hmm. and because apparently um you know it was not the book that peter brown wanted it to be and he's and and i think mark asked him if you know is there any possibility that you could revamp it and it turns out Stephen Gaines has all of the interview tapes and he and Peter Brown have fallen out and so Peter can't get any of that stuff back mm. at the time and it, didn't Peter have any say in the final product well, he might have had some say but you know it sounds to me like he didn't probably read it and and that may sound weird to you but I can tell you George Martin didn't read his books either mm-hmm. and I can tell you why I know that the, the the last one he wrote, the one that was um, – I can't, what was it called? It was the one that Genesis published in 2004. You know, in that book, he in, for all of his books, he had a ghostwriter. And uh, in, in this case, it was uh, someone named Oliver Krask. Um, name is in very, very small print in the book. And uh, I noticed reading the book that George Martin finally had the chronology of – Pete Best, Andy White, and Ringo Starr, correct. And he never mm. has when, it, when he's told the story. He's <laughs> always said, oh, I, I didn't know Ringo was coming. Yeah. And, you know, it's just not true. The paperwork shows it wasn't true. The actual chronology shows it. You know, he, he did know Ringo was coming. He listened to Ringo. He didn't like Ringo. He brought in the session drummer for the next session and then changed his mind and liked Ringo subsequently and everything was fine. But for understandable reasons, he doesn't want to say, yeah, I didn't like Ringo at first. So anyway, the chronology is correct in the most recent book. And I interviewed him about the book. And I said, by the way, I, I, I see you finally have the chronology correct about Ringo. And his response was, well, you know, I didn't know Ringo was coming. Uh-huh. I, first of all, Oliver <laughs> Kraft fixed it. And George must have not read the book you yeah. know and there were other things in his other books you know really big mistakes musical mistakes things like that that i know george martin would not have made it has to be the work of his ghostwriter and he has to have just not proofed it i don't know um i don't I, it sounds weird but i i'm suspecting that perhaps Peter didn't proof, you know, the love you make thoroughly either. He may have trusted Stephen Gaines to do it because he was a professional writer and uh, and thought it was OK. You know, I mean, Richard Buskin tells a story of um, interviewing the two of them together and saying, uh, you know, why do you say that Newtopian National Anthem wasn't very memorable when it's really just a silent track it's kind of on there as a joke and and peter said that's not in the book and richard had the book with him and he showed it to him and he got upset walked out mm-hmm. so you know he he didn't know that was in there and it, so I, I don't know i i i wish he could get his tapes back and redo the book because it, it probably it probably has a lot of information that we wouldn't otherwise have had uh 
And I think we didn't get that. We got other stuff. We got sort of salacious stuff. And um, well, I'm also, yeah. Two things about that. Uh, first of all, Peter Brown uh, appeared as a guest at Beetlefest about, oh, geez, it had to be, it was very shortly after the book came out. Mm -hmm. And and it was only at that point that people were beginning to realize what was in the book. And he he basically looked like a deer in the headlights for much yeah. of that weekend because he had to take all of these questions about all this salacious stuff that was yeah. in the book. And also it's probably revealing – that I think the next book that Stephen Gaines did after The Love You Make was a similarly sleazy, slimy examination of the Beach Boys right. called, called Heroes and Villains. So it's, right. very, so it's very possible that the sleazy, slimy aspect to The Love You Make is probably more a product of Stephen Gaines than of yeah. Peter Brown. I, I think oh, so. Sure. And I've, I've gotten to know Peter Brown a little bit, too, and he's a very nice guy and very interesting. He's got lots of stories, and he remembers an awful lot. I should also point out there's, there is one other publicist that we mm -hmm. that had a short career with the Beatles that we skipped over in that. Is that Brian, Brian Somerville. Somerville? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Brian Somerville um, didn't really get on with them particularly no. much. He was sort of an ex-military type. And um, according to an interview um, that – okay, yeah, can I put – okay. John Lennon uh, <laughs> at one point um, allowed Tony Cox to film him and Yoko for three days uh, in February 1970. And – on these videotapes, there is a very – which uh, I've seen uh, – there's a, a very interesting section where they're driving into London partly for John to watch the Some Other Guy film for the first time. He's never seen it before. He gets out of the car, and who does he run into on the street but Brian Somerville, who he hasn't seen probably since 1964. Right. And they had a – they have a friendly chat, and, you know, and then they walk on, and then John tells – Tony Cox. Yeah. You know, he didn't really get on with us very much. And at one point in Paris, George poured a glass of orange juice over his head. <laughs> <laughs> so matter of fact, so, though, is, is Brian Somerville still alive? I don't really know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, he was he was in the story so briefly that I doubt he would have gotten yeah. it. A little bit, right. you and, know. If, and plus, I think he was, if I recall, I think he was somewhat middle aged even then. Yeah. So if he was middle aged, you know, 52 years ago, yeah. you know, if he's still around, he's um, elderly. <laughs> Let's put it way that up way. There. <laughs> way up there. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But uh, yeah, it, it's unfortunate that Peter Brown has gotten, um, has gotten trashed by you know, Beatle history and Beatle historians because of the the slimy aspect of that book. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe at some point, you know, like you say, maybe he will he will get the uh, get the tapes back and will be able to maybe redeem himself. Mm -hmm. And for, and actually, he hasn't. You know, he's become kind of a non person in the Beatle world, but he certainly is not just faded away. No, he runs a, yeah. um, a a PR firm in yeah. New York. On a, he has offices on Fifty Seventh Street. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> the last time I I saw him, he was representing a guy um, who was a longtime friend of his who um, happened to buy a trove of BBC tapes because of a licensing agreement that the BBC made with a company called I think Hartwood in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, for American broadcasts of Top of the Pops. And mm. uh, he was trying to get some publicity about that. And I, I actually wrote a story that Times never ran because it's, it's all really interesting stuff. Um, the, the question was whether uh, the company really had the rights to them in perpetuity and, and what they could do with them, whether they could put them out or you know, online or, or whatever. But they had quite a lot of stuff, um, including quite a lot of Beatles stuff. So um, 
yeah, that was the last time I saw him. We, we, we went out there. There was a warehouse on Long Island. And, and so on the sort of trip there and back, he told great Beatles stories. And uh, oh, I, mean, I, mean, I think he's still in touch with Yoko. And um, I don't know about the others. But, uh, you know, he may be less persona non grata than we think. Mm-hmm. That would be... That would be nice. Yeah. So, uh, so um, it looks like, um, other than adding uh, Frida Kelly to the list, I think we've um, pretty much examined the uh, the inner circle. Um, now we have we do have another uh, another subject to get to, and we we touched on this somewhat a few weeks back, but within the last week, uh, the new issue of Beetle Fan Magazine appeared and in the uh, publisher's notes Bill King the publisher of Beetle Fan talks about an email exchange that he has had with uh, with a, a, a you know a, a knowledgeable fan who has been to many McCartney concerts over the years and uh, talking about the quality of his voice and Bill then took that exchange, which uh, which he talked about in the publisher's notes, and put them onto the Beetle Fan blog site, which is uh, Beetle Fan something new WordPress dot com. But if you if you take if you do a Google search and you go to Beetle Fan something new, I'm sure it'll take you to it. And um, he he runs this the same exchange that he had with um, with his friend. Also has some quotes from Rick Glover, who has seen um, oh something in the neighborhood. I guess by now something in the neighborhood of 140 or so or more Paul McCartney concerts, and they discuss also his uh, the the voice quality, and then also some discussion with Bill's uh, son. Uh, William Parry King, and uh, and then Bill solicited comments from from readers. So on the on the blog site after the 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 main piece, you'll see a little link saying such and such number of comments. I think the last co- uh, count I saw was thirty three comments, and uh, I threw my two cents in, and. It's basically it's people are doing the usual complaining about the about Paul's voice. And now in a lot of cases, those are people who probably never even go to the shows, but, you know, they uh, they'll see a, a YouTube clip of an audience recording. But. What seems to be happening is now more and more, even just recently, the, the interview that Paul did for the BBC, even mm-hmm. his speaking voice is beginning to get ragged. Beginning? So, <laughs> beginning? Well, it's been well, that way for many years now. Whenever yeah, well, he does interviews. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay. <laughs> but certainly his, you know, his singing voice is... Um, and this is on a night to night basis is is not what it was and the couple of points that i made in the the comment that i put in the the blog piece was that i think for one thing he needs to get out of the of doing stadium shows you know not that he can't sell out stadium shows he still sells out stadiums but i think he needs to get out of playing those kinds of huge venues and with the, you know, the, the wear and tear that being on the stage for three hours playing in a stadium will naturally do to somebody who is now 74 years old. Uh, also I think he needs to no longer be on stage for three hours I think he should be able to uh, to you know cut back the amount of time of the shows and also his amount of time certainly his amount of time on stage, you know that's worked wonders for Ringo. Ringo has paced himself. Uh, that's one of the reasons why he likes this particular uh, edition of the All Star Band. It's because he feels confident 
that he's able to pace himself uh, musically, and his voice is in, uh, you know, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the quality of Mickey Dolan's voice, and Paul's, I mean, the Ringo's is probably, uh, he's probably sounding as good as maybe he ever has, arguably. But it's not fair mm-hmm. to, to compare Ringo to Paul in this case, because, oh, no, no. you know, Ringo only sings something like, whatever, 10 right. songs in a show. Right, exactly. But that's what I mean. I mean, I'm, I don't mean that Paul should be doing 10 songs right. a night, but he can't do, he simply cannot do three hours on stage uh, anymore. And then, of course, there's the always the arguments about what he should do with the set list and, every, and nobody is going to be satisfied with that. Mm-hmm. But I think for people to basically be saying, and a number of people do in the comments uh, on in to, to Bill's piece, they you know they say that well it's time for him to just get off the stage, and if you're going to tell him to do that, he's going to do exactly the opposite because <laughs> Paul has and I and I you know I'm I despite my last name. I'm half Irish, and um, I'm a stubborn Irishman too. And uh, I know that in a lot of time, a lot of times, if somebody tells me something, something that I should be doing that I don't think I should be doing, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to do the opposite. And uh, you know, that's what uh, that that kind of of thinking is what uh, is what gave the world Heather Mills for uh, five years. Uh, you know, despite the opposition that it seemed like all of Paul's family and friends had to her, he felt that, you know, this was the woman that he wanted to be with. So whatever. Paul, Paul has even admitted this. Yeah. You know, oh, if sure. You tell him you can't do something. He's going to want to. Mm-hmm. Do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, so he should not have to, you know, uh, be told that he should he should retire because, hey, for one thing, and Ken, you know this, that, you know, Elvis Presley, even during, you know, the physical deterior- deterioration of the mid 70s was still selling out concerts. Sure. And and indeed had sold had sold out shows that had been booked before his death. And, uh, you know, Frank Sinatra was was still doing concerts and selling them out. You know, into well, uh, into his late 70s, and even in the early 90s, had two very big-selling albums, bad as they are, because his voice was a shard of what it used to be. But those two duets albums were very big sellers. So I, you know, the the the, the tack that Paul needs to um, sort of retire and get off the stage, I think, is uh, is totally misguided. But um, so anyway, that's my tirade. <laughs> Let's hear yours. Who's exactly? Ken? <laughs> There's Uh-oh. so many directions you could take this in. I mean, I really found the article interesting, but more importantly, the comments from fans. I thought were even more interesting. But I think the mm-hmm. issue that is raised is, does this damage his legacy? The fact that he's going out there and his voice is not what it used to be. But, you know, we've talked about this many times here on the show. You could say, on the one hand, for his age, compared to other uh, male singers and rock singers his age, his voice is probably better than most of them. But at the same time, you know, you have to admit it ain't what it used to be. And my concern more than anything else is by his going out and doing these long shows still, mm-hmm. plus a sound check, um, mm-hmm. is he damaging his vocal cords more than anything else? Because if he's yeah. doing that, then he's only going to get worse and worse, <coughs> and that will even affect his own uh, studio recordings. So I'm more concerned about his health and what he's doing to his voice you know, in the process of mm-hmm. doing all these shows. It's really unfair to say to someone like him of that stature, uh, it's time to quit performing. Because for mm-hmm. one thing, I do believe that he goes out and does these concerts for a number of reasons. He does it because he still enjoys it. He loves the feedback. He loves seeing, you know, the love poured out to him. You know, as we've mm-hmm. been pointing out so many times, the you know, he wants to soak it all in, that kind of thing. He loves that. He feeds off of that. And he also mm-hmm. knows, and he gets, he gets messages all the time. You can look on his website. People all over the world begging him to perform somewhere. And so many people, 
have never seen him live or they haven't seen him live for a long time. As we've mentioned, Australia, where he hasn't mm-hmm. performed in 1993. There's so many, you know, places around the world that, you know, people haven't seen him before or he hasn't played ever or hasn't played for a long time. And he cares about those fans enough to try to do something every single year. He doesn't overdo it. I haven't looked at how many dates he, he's done this year or he's scheduled to, but I think it's probably around 40, which is still quite That's a lot. Exact, it's exactly what it is. It's 40. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I do think that he's doing this for the fans. He's not doing this for the money at oh, all, no. despite what anyone might not. think, even if the prices are high in some, in some, at some concerts. He's doing this because he loves doing it. He's doing it for the fans. And also, you know, most veteran artists who have been around this long, aren't really selling new releases of their records too well. But the sure. one thing that they do sell well are concerts. Mm-hmm. And um, it's the same thing with Ringo. You know Ringo doesn't sell his studio albums at all. They're all in small quantities. But he sure mm-hmm. can sell out with the All-Stars. So they enjoy seeing continued success. It probably makes them feel like they're still relevant. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this is not to be an insult, but... It, you know, it feeds their ego a bit to feel like you're still wanted out there. So, you know, the issue about the set list is a whole other topic. Yeah, altogether. that's oh, sure. Because nobody's um, going to be satisfied with that. You know, I, I don't believe that just because he's his age that his voice has to be bad. You can take uh, singing lessons or have a vocal coach. There's a lot of people as they get older that do that. I mean, I mentioned Barbara Streisand. Uh, mm-hmm. one or two shows ago, Billy J. Mm-hmm. Kramer. Billy J. Kramer told me not long ago he started getting a vocal coach, and his singing has been better. You know, it's it's all what you do with your voice. I don't know what Paul does when he's not touring. Does he work his voice every day? That's important to know, because if mm-hmm. he doesn't, and he's on stage forty times a year, and he doesn't do that much the rest of the year, which is hard to believe because he still does his studio work. But if he doesn't work it, that also affects his voice. So. You know, my main concern overall really is, is he damaging his voice by doing this? Exactly. So. I totally agree. And, yeah. and, and in fact, I mentioned that prob- that if, if he does shorten the shows and perhaps play smaller venues, one thing he should also do is eliminate things like, like Helter Skelter, because... You know, it's uh, you know, even even though he's able to do a you know a reasonably good job on them, they're throat killers. Yeah. Mm. You know. I think he has damaged his voice, and and I don't mm-hmm. you know, at this point, uh, vocal lessons are going to bring it back. I think it's I think it's the physical mechanism and the wear and tear yeah. and the age and and it is what it is. But um, I also you know and you know I hear the same things everybody else hears, but, um, you know, uh, this may be a first, but I'm about to agree with Ken. Um, that's not possible. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Look, you know, where's this the, is what, the, where's the this calendar? is what the guy, is, this is what the guy lives for. Okay. Yeah. And if you're mm-hmm. an artist who's devoted your life to doing your art, you know, um, there's no substitute. There's no there's no hanging back in the hammock and, you know, and saying, yeah, I've done it. That's not the way his um, his ego is structured. And, you know, again, like just before, I think Ken mentioned it, I don't think either of us are using ego in a uh, negative way. I mean, it's mm-hmm. just the way his but. You know, and I think that uh, I, I don't know that playing shorter shows. Is, I mean, I think his voice is going to sound the way it sounds, no matter what he does. I think that he, you know, he likes those big crowds. He likes screaming helter skelter. He takes pride in the fact that he can still do it, and and, and it may make sense. And if we were advisors, it may make sense for us to advise that he sing, you know, and I love her for the rest of the time instead of Helter Skelter and, mm-hmm. and you know, in a small room. But I, I just don't think that's what he wants to do. And um, he, if it's if he's going to change what he's doing, he's going to have to come to it himself, you know, because as you know, we all agree um if you tell him to do what he wants but 
Right. Um, you know, but it also has to be his his decision because that's part of you know a, a, an artist's life is you get to a point and you decide to change something and it's it's your change you're making. You're not you're mm -hmm. not doing it because of of an external thing. My advice, if, I mean, if you. <laughs> If I want to hear it. I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, let's say your two cents. Yeah, I think he should. I think he should totally recreate himself as one of those sort of old blues guys who has that kind of raspy voice and just do, you know, the early Rolling Stones repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Sleepy Lemon McCartney or something. Right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, you I, know, yeah. obviously, just kidding. But. <laughs> I, I I mean I pretty much agree. I mean the two main points in the article that suck out like a sore thumb were that number one he's having a good time and you can see it when you see him and you know I mean all the self-deprecating humor and the uh, you know the the uh, drink it in and the plugging the ears after after live and let die. Mm -hmm. He's having a he's having a ball. There's no, there's sure. no question about it. And uh, the other point that was that caught my attention was the fact that he, he probably has only a few years left to continue to do this. He's not going to be able to. He, he, he probably knows better than anybody else, you know, how long he can do this. And, and you know, and he's got Nancy. Nancy, I'm sure, will be there, uh, you know, uh, giving him advice too. And uh, he knows better than anybody else how long he can do this and you know he'll figure it out I and mean, he'll figure it out eventually uh, i do agree with one or disagree with one thing that ken said that he's not doing it for the money i'm sorry ken that no is way. not that is not true. yeah he's is not true. he is making tons and tons and tons and tons of money there's no way it is not for the money he's not doing it if it was not for the money the prices would be a lot cheaper no, no, because the, the no. because the prices the prices at his at his concerts are, you know, not outrageously above those at say I don't know a Billy Joel concert or you know other as they call them heritage artists, mm -hmm. you know other classic rock artists. You know they're all pretty much pretty much the same. You know, no, as the, pay, as, the payroll as, the, the payroll must be huge given the yes. amount. Of I, you know, I, agree, I, agree that, I agree. I agree. The payroll must be huge, and, and that right. I'm sure f figures into it. But when you have all sorts of things like the VIP things and and all that, there's no. I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick my head out here and say. There is some profit involved. There is. Um, oh yeah, but I'm sure I don't think profit. You know, considering, you know, the man, the man is very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm. and I know. I don't, think, I don't think profit is really a um, uh, uh, a factor but, in whether but, he but, stays on the road or not. But let's not, let's not, you know, make this like, you know, make it sound like a charity thing. It's not. Oh no. It's not. Oh no, absolutely so. not. Absolutely not. But, uh, uh, but no, there's no way you're going to tell me that money is a motivating factor here when he's as wealthy no. as he is. He can spend yeah. the rest of his life just coasting, living on a yacht if he wants to. He could do whatever he wants to the rest of his life. He doesn't have to be doing this. His time is precious. Every single day he spends is precious. For him to share a night with us is something that we should be grateful for. He doesn't I have agree. to be I doing this. You know, no, and... I agree with that. I agree with that. But but when you have tours as long, th these tours have been very long. This one is forty shows. Assuming he does not book any more shows before the end of the year, this one is forty shows for him at his age. That is a lot. And you know, I I really, you know, I I will not sit here and you know and and make him sound like a saint as far as. How well, long these are. I mean, Dylan, Dylan does more concerts than that a year. I, I agree. I, I agree. And, and, and I would make the argument even more for Dylan. Sure. And he's old and he's even older than Paul. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. No, and mm -hmm. I, I agree. Uh, you know, you, uh, that's I mean, it's an even better argument for Dylan. I, I don't know what uh, what kind of health. Dylan is. I have not seen Dylan in in many years. I, I've only, in fact, I only saw him one time, and that was uh, decades ago uh, mm. when he played the uh, he, when he played the bridge concert. Uh, that was the only time I've seen him. I'm going to uh, see him in a couple of weeks. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would like. And the ticket. The I, tickets, I, by the way, were about sixty bucks. So. Oh, okay. Just, 
Now, yeah. there, now there, you, there you go, right there. Although, you can find bargains from McCartney shows, if you look. Um, there are bargains. Every venue is different, what they charge, too. Yeah. Right. right. Especially, well, you can go through, I've seen the prices on third-party lists get pretty low. They're not all up in the, you know, in the high, high range. But I'm just saying that given the given the prices that that uh, and and the packages and everything, it's just and also and also the uh, another issue too, and we've discussed mm-hmm. this before, is his his piecemeal booking of the shows, so that you don't know if he's going to play a town near you. That I'm sorry, that doesn't work either. And that's something that should not be should not be continued. That should be something that should change. But in other words, he should announce an entire tour in advance and not and not announce two shows here, two shows there, yes. that kind of thing, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Or even even a half a tour at a time. You can do that. I mean, you know, there are many artists that do that. You know, look what the look what the monkeys did. Oh, Ringo announced all his tour at once. Uh, mm-hmm. there, that, there's a there's an example. Actually, he added one show. He added a second Ryman show, but after the fact. But I mean, he mm-hmm. basically announced the whole tour at one time. But so, the thing is, with Paul, he spreads out his shows. He doesn't do as many. With Ringo, it's a concentrated one month or little more than a month, and that's it. Because Paul has mm-hmm. to rest his voice, it's spread out over several days with all right. the shows. And he also tries to fit in festivals, too. So, right. you know, he also has a family life. He goes back and forth from New York to back to England. You know, he visits his family. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, he's, I got agree. To, he's got to figure all that, too. None of that should prevent him from announcing the tours all at once. I mean, right. I know it's very true. If you, know, if you don't know he's going to be near you, you may plan to go traveling, you know, to mm-hmm. some distant show. And then, then he, two weeks later, announces a show near you. It's kind of not fair for, you know, fans. And also, it's um, it's not very green, you know. I mean, he's supposed to right. be environmentally uh, savvy. So, he, you know, he would want people, you would think, to travel as little as possible. Let me give you an example of that. I know somebody, I met somebody, and she's probably listening to the show from san francisco who went to see him in fresno for the opening show and i believe she told me she's going to sacramento in august to see him again and Mm -hmm. uh, i mean some people can afford that but not everybody can Mm -hmm. and fresno is a lot further from san francisco than sacramento is sacramento is only a couple hours from san francisco whereas it's like five or six hours from san francisco or uh yeah so i mean that, that that's just one example and I'm sure there are, you know, many people in Northern California who are having the same, you know, issue. And it's repeated all over the place. So, yeah, I, I think that's just a, a bad way of doing things. Mm. Um, but but on, the, on the subject of money, I recall there was a press conference many years back. It might have been 89-90 tour around then. Mm-hmm. But um, Paul was asked, you know, why why his ticket prices at the time were considered high. And he just mm-hmm. said, well, I just want the going rate. I want what Madonna's getting. I want what the yeah. Eagles are getting. And that's mm-hmm. just it. He's not charging more than those people. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I think he feels he's just as worthy as anybody else. So. It's an issue. It's not, it's not, well, it's not only the prices that he's charging. It's the fact that he's doing so many shows. He, he's doing a ton of shows, Ken. That, I think, is, is a major, you know, that's, a, that's part of the issue. You know, Hattis if, is doing so many shows. The issue, I mean, sp- not announcing them. Yes, I can, I can understand right. that. You know, right? But well, yeah, but but the the qu- the quantity of the shows. What? Uh, yeah. What? Uh, well, it, uh, it's it's getting back to you know the the amount of money he's he's bringing in that tour. The tour is bringing in a lot of money. It frequently shows up on the uh, Billboard Bulletin best selling tours. You know, for a reason mm-hmm. because. He's making he's making a lot of money on those tours. But he's you're, bringing you're, you're he's grossing unfair. a lot. You're being unfair. Well, he's, he, he he is entitled, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you I mean, just there's... said you just said yourself that he has a limited amount of time left to do this. So mm-hmm. if that's the case, why shouldn't he pack in as many concerts as he wants to in order to to make as many fans happy that maybe have never seen him or want to see him again? On the one hand, you're saying. That you know, he's only got a few more years left of doing this. So why shouldn't he do as many shows as he wants? 
I, I'm just, I'm thinking that, I mean, if, if he's, you know, to be concerned about his health, basically, because, I mean, he's really, despite the fact these shows are, you know, apart, a there's still a lot of them. And for somebody at his age, that's, it's, and up on the, uh, on the stage three hours, as we've said many times, that show is exhausting. It's, right. it's, like, it's a, well, well, so. as I, you know, as I said, I think what he needs to do is he does need to shorten the 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 uh, shorten the shows. Also, basically, stop playing stadiums where he has to, you know, blow out his uh, his voice for three hours. And which he has, uh, which he's not doing very much of this time around. Most a, a lot of the shows on this tour are small venues. Smaller, I should say. Yeah, smaller. but he's still doing. He's still doing a lot of stadiums. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, he's doing a lot of. He's he's doing almost a he's, baseball tour. Yeah, you he's know. doing Fenway. He's doing yeah. MetLife Stadium. Right. Citizens he's doing, Park. He's doing. He's doing Wrigley Field. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's doing a lot of stadium shows, and mm-hmm. you know, and it's not that he, you know, obviously it's not that he can't sell sell them out. He obviously can, but I think he, I think the time has come where that he really needs to scale down the 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 venues and scale down the amount of time that he's on stage. And if you're and saying also, that he's and, doing, if you're saying he's doing too many shows, by doing yeah. stadium shows, he's covering more people, so he can do less shows. mm Hmm. Well, anyway, okay. I've I've said I've said basically what you know. I've said what I the way I feel about that. So, but also I think that okay. we should you, you you need to talk to a vocal coach about these problems. We're not doctors here, you know. Right. Yeah, for all, for I, all that we've said about helter skelter and screaming his voice, I've also heard that it's more demanding to sing a song where you have to hold a note for a long time. It's mm-hmm. more demanding to sing my love than it is to sing helter skelter. The song that really shows up when is maybe is, maybe is, is, amazed. Yeah, right. That's that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. And probably yeah. and probably what he should do is do what Ringo has done and sing in a lower key. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you know that's because that's always been kind of a selling point of his of his shows is that people saying, well, he's hey, he's great. He sings in the same key that he sang in when he was a Beatle. But, uh, you know, that was 50 some years ago. Mm. And uh, and and it's really beginning to show. I don't think anybody would hold it against him to take no, it down. No, absolutely not. Out. It's it's kind of silly to insist on on original keys, but you know. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I don't think I agree. I don't think anybody would care. I don't think anybody. I don't know how many people would notice. There but. is one thing in that article that I want to bring up. As far as um, I don't remember who wrote about it, but I do believe that you know Paul looks his worst when he's doing these TV appearances. Yes. For whatever the reason, he just mm-hmm. doesn't come across well singing wise. And mm-hmm. certainly the case in point was the Saturday Night Live anniversary yeah. show. Mm-hmm. I mean, yep. you know, that was embarrassing. <laughs> and yeah. I hate to say that about Paul McCartney, but it really was. And he really did. Maybe I'm amazed because Lauren Michaels asked, asked him to do it. But, right. um, you know, I, I can always point to, even going back to uh, 1993, when the last show of the tour was the show in North Carolina, which was broadcast on Fox. And I remember watching that and thinking... God, his voice is, is just not that good. But it was the last show of the tour, too. So why, mm-hmm. are, they, why are they televising that one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it just right. always seems like whenever he's on TV, you know, he, he, his voice is not as good, especially when he's been on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. He's been on the show many times now. Mm-hmm. For, for whatever the reason, whether his voice was, hasn't warmed up, uh, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I find that having seen so many shows of Paul... Most of the time he's cruising and he's doing fine. He just it takes him a while for his voice to warm up, and when he does, with the exception of a bum note here and there, he's been fine. But you know, I am going to see him for a couple of shows, one of which is in Fenway Park. So I'll tell everybody what I think based on mm-hmm. that show. <laughs> well, we we want a full report. <laughs> You'll get it, and we should have Rick Lover back because who better oh, to know? Oh, we definitely should have Rick back. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, by the way, sure. while we're ta- while we're talking about McCartney, um, uh, Pure McCartney debuted on the Billboard 200 at number 15. That's decent. So, 
It, and it may have brought mm -hmm. in uh, Be the Beatles one, which came in uh, at uh, number 41. Right. So, so one thing helped the other. Looks that way. <laughs> it can yeah. always work that way, you know. It's 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 weird how one always seems to suddenly resuscitate itself on the charts when there's a new release by one of you know one of the uh, the individual Beatles. Mm -hmm. It's well, uh, it's 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 an amazing uh, an amazing phenomenon. Well, not to hammer this into the ground here. Yes, but um, the reason why I've said that Pure McCartney is an important release is because compilations and greatest hits are the 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 titles in a catalog that tend to do really well and the ones that resurface on the charts and mm -hmm. even if you go to retail stores and i know there aren't too many but even if you go to a target or a walmart or a best buy um, mm -hmm. and you look in the record section chances are you're going to find a greatest hits or a best of more so than individual titles so well, it's that, very important what, they, that, well, yeah. Because, they don't put a lot of they don't put a lot of uh, regular albums in the bins anymore. They don't have yeah. a lot of they're, they're they're devoting a lot less space to that. Even that's true. By, but Best that's by, the point. Used, yeah, I, I think of the fact that you can only find the greatest hits in a in a store these days is simply a measure of how crappy stores mm -hmm. are. Yeah, right. I know, but that's right. that is how it is. And if you've got limited space. It's really important to always keep putting out a greatest hits periodically mm. or a compilation. Mm. So whether or not you think it's a good collection based on the song selection, you know, that's a whole other issue altogether. But the fact that you know, every whatever, 10 years, 15 years, there should be something out there, mm. whether it's physical or digital, that's out there. Because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, as I say, casual fans who don't know the catalog, they're more likely mm. to go to that. It also it also came in at number nine on the top album album sales chart, and uh, the Beatles one is also on that chart too at number thirty one. Back in so you, so so you notice how the Beatles one is doing well, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. Beatles albums from uh, Please Please Me through Let It Be are nowhere on there. So well, this is <laughs> that proves the, my the, point. The, the top album sales chart is only fifty. Uh, the two, I didn't really look down on the. Uh, on the Billboard 200, but um, I did. But yeah. yeah oh, okay. Thank you. That's the only Beatles album on there. Beatles one. Right. So. Okay. And it always seems to be that way. That again, that's uh, what I mean about the continuing phenomenon of of, of one. The fact that it always seems that the, no matter what new album there might be, either a new new album or a new compilation or something by one of the other Beatles, suddenly one. <laughs> <laughs> materializes back back in the upper reaches of the charts it's uh, so now we know now we know the secret plan i guess having, that's it having having totally blown the marketing of one when it came out they're now going to be releasing this eight days a week film so that people will go buy one i i i'd be <laughs> willing i'd be willing to bet that when uh, when eight days a week is released, I guarantee you the following week one will be in the maybe even the top twenty. Well, assuming they don't, assuming assuming they don't put out a, a compilation for eight days a week, which which comp, which it'll probably end up because it'll have songs from all over the place. We so, don't know that yet, but yeah, we haven't. No, there's been nothing else. about nothing about a soundtrack. No. By the way. Uh, Pure McCartney also was number two in the top rock albums. Okay. To continue the discussion, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but to to drive this case even further, before the Beatles one was released, I would always look at the Billboard charts, whether it's the the top two hundred or the catalog album charts, and usually when Beatles albums resurface on there, it's always the later albums from Sgt. Pepper mm -hmm. on, but right. almost always. The red and the blue are on there, or they were yeah. before before the one before album. Before one, so, yes. You know, and they mm -hmm. were the best sellers. They really were. Yeah. So that that again proves why greatest hits and compilations are so important and important to discuss. So we, should we discuss them every week? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think just just to make things easier on you, Steve. Every other week. Right. Okay. Let me yes. bring in a. Let me say something very quickly. I discovered okay. uh, Periscope this week, 
and there's a group on Periscope that uh, if you have Periscope uh, from Ottawa every Thursday called Dad Band that plays Beatle covers uh, on acoustic guitar and using uh, also kazoo. It's a very funky type of situation, and but it's fun to sit there and listen to it. Some some they do okay. Some they do actually pretty good. I think the one that was really interesting, believe it or not, was A Day in Life. But anyway, uh, it's uh, their website is, and I promised I'd mention them, so guys, I, I kept my promise. It's dadband.ca is their website. And you can find them on Periscope on Thursday. Just to do a search for Beatles. Um, so there we go. And I guess there have been Paul concerts on Periscope. There have been other things, too. I think the, the bootleg Beatles, uh, the European uh, tribute group, did some uh, broadcast yesterday. But uh, there are a few Beatles things out there. I think uh, Paul, there's actually been some Paul stuff, not from Paul, but people have, have broadcast uh, beginnings of Paul concerts on Periscope. But it's right. uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I've been watching. I found it uh, last week during the uh, House of Representatives sit-in, and I've been watching people do uh, uh, things in London. There's one lady in New York, uh, Mary, uh, that uh, actually has done, has gone uh, to uh, Strawberry Fields and has gone by the Dakota, and the Dakota is being re, uh, remodeled at this point. They're they've got scaffold, scaffolding all over it. So mm -hmm. we're doing some work there. But it's uh, Periscope, I found, is a lot of fun. So there you go. Okay. Interesting. Uh, well, that's this has been our usual uh, spirited discussion. But it's uh, time to wrap things up. So uh, so first of all, uh, let me find out from Ken what he's uh, what uh, what he what kind of prizes and all he has uh, going on his website. What do I have in my grab bag this time? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Actually, it's funny you mention that because I got two important things to announce. First of all, on my weekly mm -hmm. Beatles trivia on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, I not only have the new Pure McCartney to give away, but the brand new CD from Claypool Lennon Delirium. This is a new uh, a new act from Les Claypool of Primus and Sean Lennon. And the new CD is called Monolith, Monolith of Phobos. So you can win that on my weekly Beatles trivia. And also I have another special contest, which debuts on July 2nd. And some people will be hearing the show for the first time on July 2nd, where I'm giving out a triple shot of McCartney CDs. And that includes Pure McCartney and the special editions for Tug of War and Pipes of Peace. You can wow. win all three. All in one shot. So all you got to do is go to my website on the home page. It will lead you to my special contest page. And just go to KenMichaelsRadio.com. Also, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. And Steve, how, uh, how do people get in touch with us? Uh, they can get in touch with us at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page uh, on. We have there's actually two Facebook pages. One is with the uh, Fab Four Radio uh, uh, station, and the other is our own group page. Uh, um, things we said today. Come on in, and we'll discuss the show, and let us know what you think. And you can. Uh, and we're also on Twitter at Things We Said Fab. And uh, but I, by all means, uh, send us uh, your thoughts and. Uh, you know, yell at us for talking about, uh, uh, you know, saying whatever we said about McCartney, uh, anything you want to talk about or ideas for a discussion that which is where we got the uh, Alan Klein discussion today. Uh, mm -hmm. Anytime, any, anytime uh, we're open to ideas, uh, we would love to hear from you. So there we go. Mm hmm. And Alan, anything, uh, anything to promote or no, not particularly. But you can um, you can get in touch with me either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed on Facebook, or just through the group email, which I read pretty much every day. So and respond to them if I can. Okay. And you can get, can you can get mm -hmm. a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail dot com and. I'm on, uh, as as the introduction says, I'm on examiner.com. I do Beatles Examiner, McCartney Examiner, Harris, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, <laughs> and God knows all sorts of other monkeys. You name it. I, Weird Al, I do it. I, I write about music. That's my thing. There we go. 
<laughs> this is true. This is true. And for me, you can contact me on uh, on Facebook uh, at Al Sussman, uh, on Twitter at at a s u s s four nine, or through uh, Beetle Fan Magazine, www.beetlefan.com. Uh, and again, I would recommend that you go to Beetle Fan's uh, Something New blog to uh, to read Bill King's piece and the the various comments about uh, Paul McCartney and his voice and his future in concert. Uh, and again, it's www.beetlefan something new wordpress.com but as i said if you do a google search put beetle fan something new it'll take you there actually and once you read that piece if you scroll down to the bottom and click on the previous piece it's a really nice piece by Beiser. yes about about uh, tony barrow so there we are yep Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. A wonderful piece. And by the way, in the new issue, uh, there's a uh, great piece that Bruce has done on the uh, on the butcher cover and an excellent piece by Kid O'Toole about a medium is the message type of piece about the way John Lennon and Yogo used advertising to basically sell peace. Mm hmm. It's a it's a it's a great piece, uh, and you know, um, if you, for those of you who subscribe to Beetle Fan, unfortunately you can't get it in stores too much anymore because all the stores that used to carry it are gone now. But it's still available uh, via subscription, so I recommend certainly I recommend the new issue very very much. So anyway. We've had a great discussion, and it's time for us to uh, to head on out. So for Ken Michaels and uh, Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is Al Sussman. Uh, Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm